joined by Sarah Mullen. So let me bring Sarah up. So Sarah, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. This is the Associate Director of the ACLU of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Sarah. Well, yeah, thank you Sarah. so much for having me. What's currently the status of Pennsylvania? Well, actually, I have another question kind of a leading up to it for people who may not be aware of the history of what basically kind of initially transpired in Pennsylvania. My question is, why was Viviette Applewhite um, in danger of losing her right to vote? Okay, well, for those who don't know, Viviette Applewhite is our lead plaintiff in our case. She's a 93-year-old African-American woman who actually marched with Martin Luther King at one time. And uh, she couldn't get an ID initially because under the law you had to have certain forms of ID, and one of them was a PennDOT ID. And she doesn't have any of the background documents you needed to get a PennDOT ID. So this would be, well, she wouldn't get a driver's license, but an official non-driver's photo ID from the state. Because she didn't have her birth certificate, she'd had her purse stolen, and she'd kept all of her ID in there. She didn't have a Social Security card, uh, those kinds of things that you need to get an ID. She had tried on several occasions to get an ID and couldn't get it. So the comments that we occasionally hear that people have to take responsibility, it's many people aren't taking responsibility, but unfortunately they're running into roadblocks. Now, well, that's we, true. Can I just add something about that, yes, too, is that yes. the state changed their form of ID eventually to address those issues, which was good, uh, but it, it, so they didn't change the regulations for getting a PennDOT ID, but they created a new form of Department of State ID, which was pretty clearly in response to our lawsuit where we brought all these people who didn't qualify for a regular PennDOT ID. Um, in the end, interestingly, uh, Mrs. Applewhite went, a reporter took her to PennDOT to try to get a regular ID once again, and for some reason, the fourth or fifth time she tried, they gave it to her, even though she clearly did not have the documentation required in order to get the official ID. So it really depends on what clerk you got. (laughs) Right. It depends upon what clerk you got, and then it also depends upon how much time you have to devote to attempting to get the idea and the ID, and again, just how incredibly determined you're going to be. And for people who are working, they may not be able to try four or five times during working hours to get an ID. And it's hard for people like me, who's an advocate out there educating voters, saying, you know, I try not to make people waste their time going to pen out if they can't get the ID. And so I told her, don't bother, and she did it anyway. So I think she's like, see, I told you. <laughs> Uh, which I was very happy for her, but it's really what do I say to people? Like, just to try your luck, maybe waste four hours of your life doing this? It makes it difficult to know what to say. Right, exactly, exactly. And then I remember reading the story of the uh, gentleman who went uh, by bus, and um, it was kind of this incredibly two-day odyssey where for him to attempt to get his ID Voting is a right, and it should not, in my mind, be something that is incredibly difficult to qualify to do. Now, Sarah, while we have you, where, what currently is the status in Pennsylvania, and are there going to be any challenges in this upcoming 2012 election? Okay, well, the current state, and it, as you know, it changes constantly, but the most recent things. So, well, back uh, September 18th, the state Supreme Court um, threw out the lower court's decision that upheld the voter ID law. And they ordered the judge, the lower court judge, Judge Simpson, to look at, to have a trial, so we had to have a second trial last week, to look at how these new Department of State IDs that I mentioned, these are the ones where you needed much less documentation to get them, and they're only for voting purposes, um, to see how those were being implemented and whether there was really liberal access to those. And then the second point was whether there would be no voter disenfranchisement. So that's a pretty hard, high bar for the state uh, to, to meet. And so we did have a trial last week before Judge Simpson, and we brought in you know, probably a dozen people and have affidavits from several dozen people about their experience getting this you know, easy-to-qualify-for ID. And as you say, there were stories of people who had to go twice. One woman has a two-year-old. She needed, so for the, until literally the night before the trial, what you needed for the Department of State ID included two proofs of residency. So she took her two-year-old on a bus, multiple buses, to go get two copies of two different utility bills, 
went to PennDOT. They couldn't confirm she was a registered voter because, as it turns out, they had an extra space in her name uh, that shouldn't have been there. And anyway, she ended up having to go to PennDOT twice um, and spend four hours there, not to mention her two trips to two different utility companies just to get this for voting only ID. Right. So, and, it, it, so, oh, so she was one of the clients. So after that decision, then, um, so that clearly impressed the, the judge that these IDs were not as easy to get as the state claimed. And the state had only distributed roughly 10,000 voting, voting IDs, either the free PennDOT ID for voting or the uh, new Department of State ID. So even the state's lowest estimate, which we think is very underestimated, of, of uh, 90,000 people with that ID, clearly the gap was too large for, for PennDOT to make up by Election Day. So based on that, Judge Simpson issued um, a ruling that essentially rolled things back to where they were in the primary, which is where we had a what's called a soft rollout. So poll workers will ask you for ID, but if you don't have it, they will let you vote regularly. You do not have to vote provisionally, which was the misinformation around in the, in the news after the ruling. And um, they will give you information about how you get a free to ID because he only suspended the law for the November election. So with all this, you have to have an ID. No, you don't. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. What's being done for voter education so people actually know where they stand right now? Well, that is one of the difficulties. I mean, one, there's got people like me out all summer telling people you need to get your IDs, and, uh, you know, so we sort of have to reverse that um, a little bit for the, because we don't want people to not even try to go. That's the thing. Um, so, obviously, if you don't have it and you show up and you didn't know about the law, you're good. You'll be able to vote. It's the people that we have heard the message that you need an ID and haven't been able to get one yet that are, are the people we're worried about now. So we've also asked, unfortunately, the judge uh, allowed the education campaign to go forward about this um, the ID law because it was just, it's just, the suspension is just for this election. So this is Terrence in Georgia. I was wondering, do you see what people are being discouraged from voting because of this? Um, uh, well, I mean, people are confused right now. So the state still has, they, it's been taking days for them to get their uh, education uh, materials, you know, all the PSAs they had up, all the TV ads, the radio ads. I'm getting complaints. Our organizer heard one still at 1143 last night saying that you do need ID. So we're certainly worried that there is is misinformation. I did a a quick survey of some of the big counties in Pennsylvania. They still have misleading information saying the voter ID law is in effect on the county websites. So, um, and you know, poll workers are in the process of being trained. So there's a lot of room for confusion in this. So we are going to be organizing poll monitors, um, trying to get uh, lawyers in every county. So they're not just us, but we're working with a wide variety of partners on this to try to make sure we can minimize the problems on election day. Um, I've got a question for Chris. This is um, my question, Chris, is in Virginia, we don't have photo ID. We were able to successfully defeat it, but we do have an expanded form of IDs. We're probably one of the rare states where voter suppression legislation was introduced. We can now use more forms of ID to vote than before. However, they haven't changed a lot of the campaign, which is exactly what Sarah's talking about in Pennsylvania. Um, People that are getting their voter ID cards, it says these are the four forms that you need to vote, four forms of ID, but, you know, there are others. Um, Is there anything that you can think of that we can do to sort of help people navigate this? They refer you to a website, and we know people are going to be confused. All the advocates have been giving them all the new legal IDs they can vote, and then the voter cards are coming in, and it says you can vote with this, and there's some other stuff, but we're not going to tell you what it is because we printed this early. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, first, you can go to our website, 866hourvote.org, and we have the list of the IDs that you can use in uh, in Virginia. And hi, Sarah. I hope you're doing well. Um, oh, I'm also, happy to hear your voice. <laughs> happy to hear your voice, too. Um, also, you know, we have a, a lot of partners on the ground, like the women of uh, the, the League of Women Voters, uh, Virginia New Majority, uh, Virginia Voices. Um, they're really going, working hard to get out uh, into the community um, and, and educate voters. But you know, easily we do have state pages on our website and that has the, the, the information on what 
um, IDs um, are allowed in Virginia. We are very um, happy, and, you know, there was a lot of hard work done on the ground in Virginia to make sure it was not a photo ID only state. Um, I also want to make a note that, you know, there's also some confusion uh, about the status of the laws in uh, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, in South Carolina, and Wisconsin. Um, with Wisconsin, uh, the, there is a permanent injunction, so if you are a Wisconsin voter, you are not required to present photo ID. Uh, in Texas, and uh, South Carolina, and Mississippi, and Alabama, they're under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and that is a provision um, that, you know, uh, states with a history of discriminatory law b before um, they change their election laws, it has to get pre-cleared by the Department of Justice. Um, the Department of Justice uh, did not pre-clear the laws in Texas and South Carolina. Um, both states have appealed. The trial is, uh, has wrapped up in South Carolina where we're waiting to hear that. Um, and in Texas, the federal court um, did reject the photo ID law there. Um, there are some ID requirements uh, in Texas, but again, it's like Virginia, it's an expanded list. But if you're a Texas voter, if you're a Mississippi voter, if you're an Alabama voter, or if you're a, a South Carolina voter, you are not required to present only photo ID when you go out to, um, and vote. And I, again, if you go to the polls, someone asks you for a photo ID, and they turn you away or ask you to cast a provisional ballot, um, first, you know, tell them, no, I have the right to vote um, and, and get a regular ballot or call the 1-866-HOUR-VOTE hotline. Thank you so much, Chris, because that was going to be my very next question. We are just about running out of time, so I would like to thank my guest host, Terrence Dick, for joining us, along with Randall Holmes, and then a very special thanks to our guest, Sarah Mullen from the ACLU of Pennsylvania. Congratulations on a well-fought and well-earned victory. And then also to Chris Melody Fields from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. Our next show is going to be on Thursday, and it will be Restoring Democracy, Restoring the Vote to Ex-Offenders. As we close out, I'd like to thank all my listeners, and then also I would like to remind everyone, holding elected office, that part of elections is a privilege. Voting is a right. Thank you very much for joining us on voter suppression, how to protect the vote, what's going on in your state, and what you can do about it. You can get information and hear the recording of this show at www.pdacommunity.org. Good afternoon.